Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on inference in the qubits. Thanks a lot for joining this session. Um, first of all, who I am and why am I interested in this thing? So my name is Adrian. I'm a um, machine learning engineer at Seldon. I joined Seldon around a year ago. And my background before that is mostly in computer engineering, computer software. But in between both, I, I took a master's in in machine learning, which let me kind of learn all of these things that I just didn't know about before. Um, you may also be wondering what is Seldon. Seldon is a company that tries to bridge the gap between the training of models and production productionization of models. So we are very focused in open source. So we collaborate heavily with several open source projects like Qflow and particularly KF Serving within Qflow. And even Seldon Core and, and a couple of other libraries uh, that, that, we, that we've done are also open source. There are a fairly small team um, and we are hiring. So if you're interested in these topics, feel free to reach out to me. Um, just let me know. What are we gonna see today? So we are first gonna have a look at an overview of edge computing and why is it interesting or why it may be interesting for, for machine learning inference. And we also see some problems with what, what is blocking us now from, from taking that step and how projects like Qubits kind of help us to, to go in that direction. We're also going to have a look at how, uh, uh, how Qubits works and how Qubits help us. And then we're going to see how Seldon, on top of Qubits, allows you to kind of completely bridge the gap between uh, inference devices and running inference on edge devices. Uh, in the end, we're just going to see a quick demo uh, that kind of uh, gets all of these pieces together. And, and yeah, with that, let's get started. So first of all, why is edge computing interesting for machine learning, in particular for machine learning inference, i.e. what happens after we train our models? Well, we have to think that sometimes inference requires a specialized hardware. So this could be things like uh, specialized chips, specialized processors like uh, like uh, inference processing units, which are built by this company, GraphCore, or GPUs or TPUs, uh, etc. Sometimes we also have we also need access to sensors. You can think of you can think of any kind of facial recognition example, or you can also think of, for example, humidity sensors that uh, may be present in, in IoT scenarios in farms and an agricultural setting. Sometimes we also need access to actuators. And by actuators, I mean anything that acts on the world. So for example, this could be uh, engines like servo engines or even lights, uh, LEDs, things like that. So how is this a specialized hardware usually used? And, and this is, uh, and here I mean, how, how is currently used and uh, before we bring in the inference on the edge uh, uh, component. So we have to think that uh, usually uh, this entire loop goes something like this. So we've got some sort of controller and this could be like any kind of processor. It could be a Raspberry Pi or it could be something smaller like an Arduino. This controller usually senses data from the world. So essentially uses sensors to kind of sense something about its environment. With this data, usually when inference is not performed here, this data usually goes to a cloud. And by cloud here, I mean any kind of cluster. It could be an on-prem cluster, uh, just some kind of data center, remote data center. And here we refer to the cloud. It says the data here. Inference then is performed here. And this could also be any kind of remote service. And then the result of the inference goes back to the edge environment, to the to our controller device. And then uh, based on that prediction, it acts on the world. It acts on the world through the use of actuators, like again, like LED lights or uh, servo engines, anything like that. And then it goes back again. So we have this kind of loop that segues here into the cloud and back again. Now, what are the problems with this approach? So we have to think that this cloud, this data center usually is quite remote. It's quite far away from where we are. So if you think of 
any, so for example, if you think of, of a farm for an agricultural setting, usually the data center is going to be far away. That means that any kind of access to this cloud to, to perform inference is usually going to have a high latency penalty. And not just high latency, we need to think that these devices usually, uh, it's not weird that they have poor connectivity. And poor connectivity means that not just that sometimes they may just not be able to reach that cloud, but also that it's one of these requests, it's probably going to cost us money because they are probably going to be using some kind of, of uh, mobile network. And last but not least, we need to think about all the privacy concerns that relate from, from here. Every time we send from our edge device a request to the cloud to perform inference, we're going to be sending private data. And we need to think about what type of private data we are talking about. So usually in machine learning context, this type of data uh, refers to, to, to face images for face recognition, voice samples for AI assistance, health readings, like electrocardiograms. So very, very, very personal data. Once we move that data out to the cloud, the, the user, in this case, assumes that it's just, they just lost control over that data. We don't know what's happening with that data afterwards. We don't know if that data is getting stored. We don't know if that data is being analyzed. We don't know anything about it. So why do we want to do it this way? Why do we want to send it over to the cloud? We have to think that in theory, we've got everything that we need on the edge side of things. So we've got all the hardware, obviously. We've got the data because the data is coming from sensors. So why do we want to go to the cloud at all, for inference? What's stopping us from doing that? Well, one could argue that usually uh, inference workloads can be very heavy, can be very resource heavy. However, uh, there are advances on that, on that direction to solve that. On one hand, we've got, uh, so like most famous and most mainstream uh, machine learning frameworks are working on that. They are releasing lightweight runtimes like TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite, to run inference on, on low resource devices, usually IoT devices. And we also have the specialized processors like uh, uh, IPUs, inference processing units, DPUs, TPUs, all kind of PUs that help us uh, process this load faster. Another point that we can think about when we think about why don't we process all of this on, on the edge is, well, the edge environment is notoriously hard to manage. And why is it hard to manage? Well, uh, we've got a huge range of, of devices when we think about edge devices. And we are talking about Raspberry Pi, Arduinos, Nvidia Jetsons, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even within each of these families, uh, there are, I don't know, like tens of devices, tens of different models. Each one of them is going to come with its own architecture, with its own uh, system, is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We usually have, in its context, a large number of devices. So if you think of a factory, for example, it's going to have hundreds or thousands of edge devices. And again, sometimes with poor connectivity. And this even gets worse when you think that each one of them is going to be usually connected to hundreds of sensors and actuators. It's one of them with its own architecture, its own models, its own way of accessing the data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's just the beginning. Uh, if we think about how can we add new nodes, how can we check the health of our edge devices, how can we uh, serve new versions of our trained models, how can we support multiple ML frameworks, because when you're bringing in machine learning, it just adds a new axis of complexity. And how to scale, uh, all of this, how, to, how do you run it? Uh, let's say you want to run your model to serve it across two or three, four devices. How do you manage that in, in, in an efficient way? Well, it turns out that many of these problems have already been solved in the cloud. Uh, so for example, in the cloud, we've got Kubernetes, which, which was pretty much built for this, uh, for, with this goal in mind. So Kubernetes is built from scratch for uh, orchestrating for managing for scaling workloads in the cloud. Sorry. So why don't we change that just running inference on the edge setup to maybe open up access to the cloud, but just for management. So not sending any data, any personal data, and not sending 
without send, without uh, offloading any inference to the cloud. How could we do this? It would be great because uh, this would mean that, uh, well, through Kubernetes, we will get access to a lot of declarative APIs that help us manage our resources. And here resources in the Kubernetes world are essentially abstractions over services, over nodes, over pods, uh, et cetera, things that let us manage our, our, our work workloads. And not just that, but it also allows you to define custom resources. And essentially these custom resources are abstractions that encode architectural patterns of our own. It also has advanced scaling, advanced ingress, uh, has a bunch of things that were built, uh, that are built into Kubernetes and also give us access to a wide range of goodies and tools that help us manage our workload. So uh, these are things like Celdon Core to, 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 to deploy machine learning models, these are things like Helm and Argo CD to manage our resources in Kubernetes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, sounds great. How can we do that? Well, uh, as of today, there are, I, I would say this, these are the three main approaches to, to add. On one hand, we've got Qubit, which we're going to talk about later. On the other hand, we've got K3S and Fleet, which are built by Runter, a company called Runter. And they essentially take a different approach. Essentially, K3S just lets us, whereas Qubit, as we, as we will see, allows us to just attach edge devices into a very large Kubernetes cluster. K3S and Fleet take the opposite approach. They just allow you to have very small Kubernetes cluster, and Fleet allows you to manage all of this. These are just different approaches. Uh, today, we are going to focus on Qubits. Now, what is Qubits? Uh, I've, I've talked a bit about, about it already, but what it is? Uh, well, Qubits is an open source project. Uh, initially started by Huawei, but which is now an incubating project within the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. According to the words, uh, Qubits is an open source system extending native containerized application orchestration and device management to hosts at the edge. Now you're going to dive deeper into this to see what, what it means. Before doing that, though, just as a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in Qubits. And I'm just saying that because uh, I may say something's wrong about Qubits. I've just approached this as a user. So this is how I have understood that Qubits works. So just uh, sorry in advance uh, to the Qubits team for any uh, mistakes that I've made. So Qubits essentially allows us to manage our edge devices as regular Kubernetes nodes. And again, uh, to, to going back to what I just said uh, earlier, in Kubernetes nodes are just an abstraction. They are just places where Kubernetes is going to put load, you're gonna, is going to uh, run pod services, processes, etc. Kubernetes doesn't know necessarily about what these nodes are. So once we bring in these edge devices, Kubernetes just knows that it has more nodes. It doesn't need to know anything else. Once it has nodes, uh, Kubernetes can schedule workloads on them. Because of this transparent, this abstraction uh, concept of, of Kubernetes, that means that this gives us, in theory, almost full access to all of the Kubernetes goodies. So, for example, uh, any kind of, if, if you can run any kind of pod service deployment, any kind of Kubernetes primitive, then you are golden. Uh, just as an example, uh, what that means is, uh, so for example, here we can see the nodes in our cluster, and we can see how the a new node called uh, Raspberry, because we are running our nodes in Raspberry Pi, so our edge nodes, has been attached to our cluster in the cloud. Uh, and by cloud here is, is my laptop, but this could be the cloud. And we can see that it has a new role, which is edge. Now, how does this work? This is, this is perfect, but how does it work? Well, Qubits has the concept of the cloud side and the edge side. So the cloud side is going to be managed by a component called CloudCore. CloudCore is responsible for talking to the edge devices to tell them what to do, and also to sync back to Kubernetes any kind of update on the cluster, like a new node has been added. Now, cloud code, cl sorry, CloudCore communicates through ports 10,000 and 10,002 with the edge side to, for, to set up new devices and also to sync any kind of a status change. On the edge side, what we've got is edge core. So edge core is what's going to be running on each of our edge devices, and it's going to be syncing with cloud core. So essentially, as an example, so let's say that you deploy a pod, like uh, uh, the one that we have here, you deploy a pod into a edge device. 
what happens under the hood is that Kubernetes is going to create a pod that is going to go into an enterprise. Cloud Core is watching over those and detects that. And what it does is it says, Edge Core, well, I've got this pod with this configuration. And again, because Kubernetes is a declarative API, it allows you to do this relatively easily. And it's going to have this image, it's going to have this, this configuration, etc. cetera. Edge Core receives that. And then internally within the Edge device, it spins up uh, all the necessary Docker containers, et cetera, to run that workload. Between them, they talk using web sockets. So it's important to mention that because of this architecture, Edge Core is going to need to be installed on each one of our Edge devices. So that is the, the management cost that we pay to in order to use qubits, that you're going to need to make sure that all the different Edge Core nodes, Edge devices have Edge Core installed and that they can talk to the cloud cluster just for two uh, scenarios, just for two actions. One of them is for setup, for the initial setup to let the cloud know that there's a new Edge node and also for any kind of, of syncing. So, and just to clarify that, if let's say you lose connectivity on your Edge device, the workload there is still going to keep running. The problem is that the cloud is not going to know anything about the health in that edge device of, of the different processes that are running. What else does Qubits bring to the table? So uh, remember what I told earlier about how Kubernetes lets you define your own abstractions to encode your own architectural patterns. Uh, these are uh, called custom resource definitions. So Qubits uh, installs a couple of uh, CRDs, a couple of custom resource definitions. One of them is device, the other one is device model. Essentially here, device and device model represent well, device model represents an archetype of a sensor or an actuator that you can interact with. And device is a particular instantiation of that device, of that sensor or actuator. So for example, we could have, let's say, a device model custom resource uh, that specifies a particular type of proximity sensor that we're going to use in our, in our project. And you can have two instantiations of that custom resource. So you could have uh, one for the front sensor and one from the back sensor. This allows you to provide a unified interface to access the sensors and these actuators, and also to check their health and everything else. However, you could argue that, well, how is it possible that it provides something so generic? Well, it also provides the concept of controllers. So controllers, in this case, are custom logic, custom code, and essentially controllers are Docker images, so you're able to define your own that interact with a particular sensor. So for example, going back from the previous example, you could have, uh, so let's say you've got a sensor, a proximity sensor. Uh, you would have a sensor controller, which again, you have full control over it because it's your code. And the sensor controller would read from the sensor. Based on this reading, it would update the state of the custom resource which again is the instantiation of a particular sensor. And the pod, uh, let's say a pod that we've got using these, these ones, these sensors, could just read that state. Now, what happens with actuators? Like this is great for reading, but what happens if we want to send actions? Well, all the internal traffic that happens between devices within the, the edge device uses an MQTT queue. Uh, and so essentially, MQTT is a protocol to manage events in usually in low resource devices at large scale. So let's say the pod wanted to send an action. The pod could just send an event to the, M to the internal MQTT queue. And again, each, one, each edge device will have its own MQTT queue. The relevant controller could then pick up that event to act on a device instance, to act on a particular actuator. This is great, and it works pretty much and out of the box. However, I did find some quirks with qubits, and I thought it would be worth sharing in case you find you, you run into them. On one hand, we uh, as I saw the uh, the Kubernetes logs are uh, generated. So Kubernetes out of the box has some logging facilities. However, the logs generated on the Edge device 
by default, they, they don't get served back upstream to the cloud cluster. So you don't have uh, that good thing in Kubernetes, which is you just go into any Kubernetes cluster and it's very easy to see the logs of its pod as they get generated. Instead, they've got a workaround. I, I didn't dive much into it, uh, but I know that they have a workaround. So it's a quirk, uh, just it's not a blocker because it has a solution, it's just something to keep in mind. The same, something similar also applies to metrics. Now, also something else that I haven't mentioned is that all the traffic inside the device, and by here traffic, I mean like HTTP traffic between services, etc., is managed by a, a, a component that they develop called Edge Mesh. So Edge Mesh is sort of a DNS service or a proxy that they develop. And I found some issues with it. So essentially I wasn't able to read any Kubernetes service within the Edge device. I do think that there is a possibility that this is just not working because I'm using um, a local cluster using kind. Kind is sort of like another uh, Kubernetes distribution meant to run locally. And because it's running locally, it has some, some quirks of its own on how it manages the networking. So it could be because of that. So it's not necessarily Qubit's fault here, it could be kinds. And then also something important to mention, which is probably obvious for someone uh, with experience in, 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 the, in, in an edge environment. You could think, well, uh, you need to think to keep in mind at all times that the edge environment, edge devices usually will, will not have the same architecture as your laptop. So your laptop will have x86, edge devices may usually have ARM. And you could think, as I naively thought at first, that's fine, I've got Docker, I don't care about that. Uh, as I realized pretty soon, that's not the case. You need to build your Docker images first with uh, image bases compatible with, with ARM and also build them with that architecture in mind. Uh, you can do that locally in your laptop, that's fine, but you just need to do it explicitly. Something else that I thought was, well, okay, I've got Docker images for ARM. The rest of my code is Python and Python just runs on an interpreter, so that's fine. I don't need to change anything. Growing again, there are, in Python in particular, for example, there are a lot of dependencies that link back to native components. Uh, and they do this mainly for efficiency reasons to be faster. Now, some of them, uh, like for example, one of them that I found was linking to a uh, Rust code, to a Rust binary. And I tried to build that binary for ARM. Turns out it's just impossible. That library was unmaintained and it just didn't work in ARM. So I just couldn't use that component. Something important to keep in mind. Now, you're going to see a very quick demo of how, uh, how we can deploy a workload, a very simple workload in, a, in, in an device using Qubit. So I'm just going to switch here to my, uh, my Jupyter notebook. So what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, add a LED to our Raspberry Pi, uh, a green LED, and we just make it blank, something very simple. Some prerequisites. Uh, well, you need a Kubernetes cluster in place. I've got a local cluster for that. Uh, you need qubits installed and you need an edge device that is already hooked to qubits. We have added some instructions in, in the main repo of the talk. Uh, you can check them out. So, yeah, so uh, the first step would be implementing our code. Our code is pretty simple. So, essentially, we're just going to use a library called GP, GPIO0, which allows us to interact with the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. It's essentially let you uh, hook any, any jumper wire and control the IO. So for example, here it's very simple. We just uh, say that on ping, on ping with number 17, there is a let. We just gonna turn it on and off uh, every second forever. The next step, as I was mentioning earlier, is to build a Docker image, which does this. Which does this. And uh, for that, we just extend from the ARM, ARM uh, Python official limits. We just copy our, uh, we start some requirements, which are essentially just a library. And then we call our script, a very simple script. We build that. And here I just wanted to mention this, how we specify explicitly the platform. And we, the next thing that we will need is to specify our Kubernetes pod resource that is gonna deploy this workload. And this is something very simple. So we just say that this is, this is a pod, this is essentially a way of running a process, Kubernetes. It has this name, let example, it's gonna use this image. And 
also something worth mentioning is that we're going to need to load a file that acts in the Raspberry Pi as the interface with the GPIO board. This file is located at dev GPIO mem in, in the native Raspberry Pi, and we're just going to mount it in our container. We also need to give security context. We need to give privilege access to access this device. So once we've got that, we're going to deploy it and we're going to switch here to our terminal just to kind of show that now, so this is uh, K9S, which is showing the state of our Kubernetes cluster. And here we can see that the Raspberry node has been added as a node to our cluster, to our Kubernetes cluster. And if we look at the pods, we can see that we have now deployed a pod. And if I, uh, and, and if I switch my camera, I'm not sure if I can do. Okay, that's fine. Uh, for this example, for this demo, it's very simple. It's very, it's very tiny, so it's not important. I'll switch it later for the demo, uh, but that's fine. Cool. So we can see now that our pod is running in our Raspberry node, and and the pod and the the LED is blinking. Just believe me on that. We can now remove it, and we can just leave the pod as we would do usually in in any Kubernetes cluster. And we can see now that the pod is terminating. We know if we now go back to the slides. Uh, well, the next step now would be to actually deploy any inference workload in our cluster. And for that, we bring into the table seldom core. Now, in general, deploying models is pretty hard. You've got a lot of machine learning frameworks. Each of them has have their own quirks. You need to think about, it's, it's not just about deploying a model, it's, it's about how to serve it, how to analyze it, how to monitor it. It has a few things of its own that usually you wouldn't find in a regular web server. And in fact, there is this famous picture by a paper from Google about technical depth in machine learning systems. We need to think that usually the machine learning code is just gonna be this very small uh, bit in the middle. Everything else in our machine learning pipeline is gonna be about uh, managing the configuration, collecting the data, processing that data, extracting features. And once you have that, you can train your model, but then you need to think about how to monitor that model, how to serve it, how to scale it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Seldom Core is essentially a toolkit that allows you to bridge the gap at the end. So what happens after you have trained your model? How do you serve it? How do you monitor it in production? Now, Seldom Core is an open source project that uh, Seldom created a while back uh, in, their own words, our own words, it's an MLOps framework to package, deploy, monitor, and manage thousands of production machine learning models. What does that mean? How is that? How, how does that work? Uh, well, essentially, uh, as another view of, of uh, another way of viewing that concept, it lets you go very easily from, from a set of model binaries, which are going to be the snapshots of your, of your model, your train model, into a set of Kubernetes resources that expose your model. Sometimes this is just as simple as exposing a container, a single container with your model. Sometimes it's a bit more complex and requires having an inference graph. And, and an inference graph could have any kind of intermediate steps like processing your input, uh, processing your output. This could be relevant, for example, if you think of an NLP setting where you may have some text incoming, but the model doesn't work with text, the model works with, with numbers. So you need to first tokenize that, that, that text and that could be done in a pre-processing step. You could also have more advanced things like uh, multi-arm banded routers, uh, which decide which model is behaving better, applying reinforcement learning principles, etc. Other things that it brings to the table are a set of pre-built inference servers for a subset of machine learning frameworks like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, etc. It also gives you the ability to write custom ones if you want to. And a set of other things that we usually don't think about, like, well, how do you run A-B tests? How do you run SATO deployments? Uh, this is particularly important in machine learning because it turns out it's very hard to compare two versions of the same model and to know which one is, is behaving better. And then uh, with, uh, it also integrates with us on other libraries. So for example, Alibi uh, is a library, another open source library with, by Seldon, which focuses on explainers that helps you explain your predictions, other detectors, to see whenever you get data outside of your training set, i.e. data that your model hasn't seen before, and other integrations for monitoring, logging, etc. 
So it's worth mentioning that this is built on top of Kubernetes, it's cloud native. So it should be, you should be able to run it on any major cloud provider under Kubernetes clusters. And also on on-prem Kubernetes clusters, including OpenShift, for example, which is in the end, a Kubernetes distribution. Now, how does it work? Well, Seldon Core essentially implements a new CRD, a new abstraction, a new Kubernetes abstraction that allows you to, the, to create a custom resource in Kubernetes that is going to specify your model's configuration. And that is what you can see here in the left side. So for example, here we would create a, a CR, a custom resource of, that, uh, of type Seldon deployment with a name, which is going to be example model, and a predictor. Now this predictor, for example, is, is, is built out of a complex inference graph that you can see here on the right hand side. And in here, you can see how the, the different components are defined here in the graph. And you can see, well, the root is going to be a transformer. Transformer is just going to process the input and transform it, uh, the, which is going to be named input transformer. And then it has two children, which are uh, a model named my model, and then another model named classifier. Now it's worth mentioning because it's classifier, uh, we know that it's going to be a scikit-learn model. It's enough to just say, well, implementation is going to be a scikit-learn server. And this is linking back to the pre-built inference servers. And these are where my model weights are stored. However, it still gives you, even though it gives you this flexibility, this ease of access, it also gives you enough power to say, well, uh, my model, I just want to run this image. I don't want to do any fancy inference server stuff. I just want to run this image. And that's fine. It lets you do that as well. Now we can see what happens when we create this in our cluster, when we apply it. And we can see that it creates, uh, if we looked into it, uh, we would see that it creates a pod with a bunch of containers. Uh, these containers are, well, on one hand, it's going to have a, a, a sidecar container that is injected into the pod by Seldon. Uh, and we refer to this as an init container. This one is responsible for, and has the logic to download the models, the, the model weights that you specify in your CR, for example, here, in model URI, and make them available to your model, to your model's container. And it does this by using uh, Kubernetes uh, PVCs uh, to kind of have some kind of temporary storage for uh, which your container, your model's container can access. Besides that, you would just create the different containers inside the same pod of each step on your inference graph. And it would also inject a second uh, container, sidecar container, which we call the orchestrator, that is the one receiving the input request from the user and deciding how these should circulate alongside the inference graph. These inference servers are essentially uh, uh, the, the prepackaged ones are a set of Docker images that we have included in Seldon that essentially know how to load a model for a particular framework. So for example, if you say, well, uh, I've got a model in a file called model a joblib in Google Cloud Storage or somewhere else, and I can just instantiate the Seldon deployment CR, which uh, I'm just going to say that it's going to use the scikit-learn prepackaged server, and that's it. I'm good to go. Seldon will take care of that and will deploy your model. Same applies for, let's say now you've got an Exiboost model. Uh, you could have your weights stored somewhere. You just need to tell, to point Seldon to them and to tell Seldon that this model is going to be deployed using the XGBoost inference server. Out of the box, we have support for other frameworks, like, well, we have MLflow that allows you to kind of abstract between your training and gives you like an abstract layer so that you can, uh, in theory, MLflow works with multiple frameworks. And we also have other ones like, like TensorFlow and a few more. However, you still have uh, the ability to define a custom inference server. And that's something that we will do in the demo. Other things that Seldon Core brings to the table are integrations with Prometheus for monitoring and with Grafana to, to see this monitoring. Extending this monitoring even further, it also gives the ability to track complex or more advanced machine learning metrics. So to do this, because these are usually very heavy to compute, we leverage K-native, which allows us to build an asynchronous pipeline in Kubernetes that does things like add layer detection to detect any example and input data that may be outside of your training example, 
drift detection to see if your if your inference data is shifting away the probability distribution is shifting away from your training sets a bit more complex than a lie detection or any kind of custom metrics and these custom metrics uh, sorry these custom metrics could include things like accuracy etc now these two these first two we've got a set of algorithms implemented in the Alibi Detect library, which is also open source. I highly encourage you to check them out. Uh, it's definitely a very interesting library that you can use even outside of Solon. So those things essentially implements algorithms for detection settings, for monitoring settings in machine learning. Now leveraging the same k-native integration and building asynchronous pipelines, Solon Core also gives you integrations with Elasticsearch to keep track of your inference data and it also links with a second library, which is called Alibi Explain, which essentially allows you to explain the predictions that your model is making. Now, as you would have imagined, uh, these things are can all be configured through the same seldom deployment CR. So essentially this abstraction not just doesn't give you just value, doesn't give you just the ability to deploy models, but also to configure all these kinds of things that are usually secondary afterthoughts, but they are definitely important in, in a machine learning production setting. All the things that it allows you to do is deploy models in, in, in a comparison setting. So usually machine learning, it, as, I said, as I mentioned earlier, it's usually very hard to say if a model is behaving better or not, mainly because it has this stochastic component to it usually. And because the inference training inside the inference data can be very different from what we have in, 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 in the training set. So it's hard to know, it may be better with the training set or with the test set, but you never know if it's going to be better with the inference set unless you try it in production. Because of this, Seldom Core has built-in support for advanced deployment models, for example, A-B tests uh, so, or SADO deployments. So essentially here, we can see how that's done again through the same CR, so through the same abstraction. You would have, again, a Seldom deployment resource, which in this case is going to be named Wines Classifier because it comes from a different example that classifies, uh, that predicts the quality of wine. And in here, we are have we're going to have two predictors. Uh, before we had one, now we're going to have two. Uh, the first one, uh, we're going to say both of them are going to be MLflow servers. They're, they're going to use they're, these are models trained with MLflow. So the first one we're just going to point it to a GRI in in a folder called Model A in Google Cloud Storage. We say that is model MLflow, which is going to use an MLflow the the MLflow inference server, and we're going to send fifty percent of the traffic to it. The second one. We are just going to point it to a second folder in our remote storage, which is going to be model B. And they're going to say that its implementation type is, is MLflow server. And we again send this 50% of the traffic. You can check this example here, by the way, on this link. Uh, similar as this, you can also have SATA deployments, which are essentially a way of just having these two models, but sending all the traffic to both, but without sending any response back from, from one of them. Essentially, just deploy in the shadow. Right. So, with this, we have seen what Seldom Core is. We have seen how Kubernetes allows us to run Kubernetes workloads and add devices. So now what we have to see that is, can we run both of them? Can we combine both to actually run inference workloads in add devices? And that's what we're going to see now in the demo. Now, before uh, going into it, I just want to, to kind of highlight what we're going to do is we're going to build a face mask detector, which essentially going back to the loop, the, like the inference IoT loop that we saw earlier, is going to read, it's going to have a Raspberry Pi, and it's going to be doing all the work. The Raspberry Pi is going to take a snapshot from a camera attached to it, a Raspberry Pi camera. So this camera is going to, so it's going to be sensing data from the sensor. It's going to be our camera. It's going to run inference inside the device using Seldon Core. Uh, to kind of run a model that checks if we've got a face mask put on or not. And based on the output of this inference, it's going to turn on or turn off green, red, and green LEDs. So essentially, if it doesn't detect anyone, it's going to turn off both LEDs. If it detects someone with, with, with a mask, it's going to turn off the green LED. If it doesn't, is going to turn, if it detects someone without a mask, it's going to turn on the red light. It's kind of a semaphore without the yellow. Now, we're going to deploy these workloads into the Raspberry Pi using Qubit. So 
On the other side, on the cloud side, you're going to have a Kubernetes cluster, which in this case is going to be my laptop, but it could be in the cloud, which is going to be running qubits. So we're just going to be, for all management, we're just going to be interacting with this Kubernetes cluster. And qubits is the one that is going to be scheduling these workloads into the Raspberry Pi. Because of the low resources of the Raspberry Pi, we are going to use TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite, to run this, to run inference, to run this workload. Now, as you uh, as you may imagine, I haven't mentioned that Celeron Core supports TF Lite. So we are just going to build an inference server for TensorFlow Lite. So essentially, another view of how the example is, or to see what kind of workload, Kubernetes workload, we're going to be running on our red device. We are going to be loading. We are going to deploy into our red device through qubits an instance of our cell, of a cell deployment custom resource, which we're going to call face mask detector, which is going to point to our custom TensorFlow Lite inference server. And it's going to load a set of weights from uh, a repo, which essentially, which is uh, it's actually someone that trained a face mask model, face mask detection model and here. This is to be, I just need to give a massive shout out to them. Uh, this is a company called iZoo.tech, which has essentially open source a repo with uh, face mask detector models on a bunch of frameworks. And we're just going to use one of them. So with this, we're going to be able to run the model in our red device. The second step is going to have, is going to be a second pod that is essentially going to implement this IoT loop. So it's essentially going to be reading from the camera is going to be sending that data to our model, which is also deployed in the edge device. It's going to get that prediction out. And based on that prediction, it's going to turn on or turn off set of LEDs. So again, to re-emphasize, all of this workload, all of the inference is going to happen on the edge device, which was kind of the goal at the beginning. Before going into the demo, so I wanted to mention, it's uh, this model hasn't probably been calibrated. So it may contain biases. It's definitely not safe to use with a further assessment. And, and I say this because ML is definitely quite super powerful. However, we always have to remember that with great power comes great responsibility. And it's our responsibility to use machine learning thoroughly and ethically. In general, we need to think about standards. We need to think about uh, principles that we need to follow. This is quite a complex topic that we are not going to get a, a, into this session. But just something worth keeping in mind. Without further addition, just let's just go to the demo. I'm gonna switch back to my cube, to my Jupyter notebook, and we can see here the schematics for the example. It's very simple. I mean, it's, it's just uh, an extension of the previous one. So we're just gonna have a camera attached to it, and we are gonna add a new LED, which is gonna be a red LED. Now, uh, the pre requirements are the same. The only difference is that we are gonna need to install Seldom Core in our cluster. And for that, you can follow the Celeron Core documentation. And here, we're just going to assume that we've got that installed already. Now, the first step, as, as we were saying earlier, is going to be to develop an inference server with TensorFlow Lite. How do we do this? It's fairly simple. We just need to extend the Celeron component interface of Celeron Core. And we think here, we just want to override two key methods. So one of them is load, and the second one is predict. So first, if you look at load, essentially load is responsible for giving a set of weights that is going to be sent by from the storage initializer container, loading our model, loading any kind of logic. So for example, here, we would just load a TF Lite model, and we will also read from the model what is the input index that where we need to put the data and where is the output index, uh, the output tensor where we're going to read the data from. Besides this, we will need to implement the predict method, which as you can see is fairly straightforward. So first of all, we would set our data in the input tensor and then we would just call the model and just get the output out of it. This is uh, how TF Lite works, by the way. Now the next step is going to be to containerize our model. And for that, we just need to, well, we just need to extend our base. We just need to install a couple of dependencies that are necessary, are needed by some of our Python devs. And that's it. The command then would just be uh, spinning up the Seldom Core microservice using our model, our new model. 
that we would do that. We would build our image again, building it compa in a compatible manner with IR ARM. And to add it to Seldon Core, to configure it to Seldon Core, and again, this step is not necessary. Uh, there are ways to just run that image. However, it's a bit cleaner. That's why I've decided to include it on the demo. Uh, if we assume that Seldon Core has been installed using Helm, we can just update the, the, config the installed configuration parameters through Helm as well. So essentially, we can just say that, well, I'm going to have a new predictor server, which is going to be called the Light server, and you can find it here. And that's it. We are done. The next step also worth mentioning is, as you as I mentioned earlier, we have a couple of sidecar containers. One of them is going to initialize uh, the model weights in our, it's going to download the model weights. That container obviously is not compatible with ARM, so we're going to need to build a new one compatible with ARM. I've done that already in the background. Uh, you can find that one here. So again, to configure it and to sell, sell them to use that, it's enough to just say, well, uh, the storage initializer is just going to use this image and to modify the Helm installation parameters, and that's it. Now, to download it, uh, it's enough to define a cell on deployment resource that we're going to name face mask detector that is going to use the implementation that we just created here, Light Server, and it's going to download the model ways from here, which is the iZoo.tech uh, repo where these models have been st stored. And last but not least, we're going to specify that this model has to be deployed to the node with name Raspberry. There are cleaner ways to do this in, in Kubernetes. You can set tolerations and affinities and, and taints. I, I just took this simple way, simple road. Now we can just deploy this. And if we sit switch to our terminal, we can see here how uh, we should be able to see here how our cell deployment is being created. And if we look at the pods, we can see how uh, the model initializer is currently downloading the weights and the model is getting uh, spinning, is spinning up. With, uh, oops, sorry, with the image that we just created. The next step is going to be implementing the camera reader, uh, which is going to be the one with its IoT loop. Now, for that, we are just going to use the same library, GPIO0, in a library called ByCamera, which allows us to access the camera. Uh, the main steps, the main blocks from this, to be honest, are just uh, well, capturing. We are just going to have a loop continuously capturing the camera. We are going to run inference on its frame. And we're going to add the delays, delays based on its frame. Now, to run inference here in this context will just mean sending a prediction to our model, which is also deployed in the same device. So we just need to populate the right payload. We send it uh, to this endpoint that is going to be exposed automatically by Seldon Core. And we read the response and we check which classes based on which classes with high confidence have been predicted by the model. Like, uh, is it? Uh, Someone, is there someone with a mask? Is there someone without a mask? Or I don't know. And based on that, we're just going to update our LEDs. Now, I don't think if I'm going to have enough time to do it, but if we just continue through it, we would just build uh, the Docker image with the same, same, same instructions. We would build, build that, and then we would deploy it. To deploy it, uh, on the slides, I mentioned that it was going to be in a separate pod. Instead of that, I'm just going to run it on a separate container. So we would just have this camera reader container that is going to be deployed alongside our model in the same pod. This is something that Seldon allows you to do. The main difference is that it's going to have access to the camera libraries. So we would just do that, and we would deploy that. Now, if we see our terminal, we can see that now it should be trying to update our model deployment. So in here, it's going to be, first of all, first of all, the model initializer container is going to run. It's going to download our model weights. And then it's going to spin up the model and the camera reader. Now, these uh, pods are still starting. Once they get started, Seldon uh, will tell Kubernetes to switch down this pod that we initially deployed. So essentially, now here we are updating the pod running in our S device purely through Kubernetes uh, instructions. I think I'm not going to have time to show you the result, but essentially, uh, the camera gets turned on and, and and the lights get turned switch on uh, to green or red. I'll make sure I submit a video to by the time the talk is is stream is is played on on the repo. Now, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, thanks again for joining the session. Please fire any questions that you may have. I'll be trying to answer the question the questions at the same time while you're showing the video. And again, just to reemphasize, we are hiring in Selden, so please uh, give me a shout. 
if you want to get more information about that. Thanks a lot for joining this session.